vamos passar à próxima uh, apresentação, uh, uh, que será uma, uma apresentação feita por duas pessoas, nós as duas grandes amigas da Suécia, a Susan Berg e Jamie Bolling. Uh, a Susan Berg é, é membro da, da direção do Independent Living Institute na Suécia uh, e tem participado ativamente no movimento das pessoas com ciência desde a década de, no, de 80. Uh, e a Jamie Bolling também é, é, faz parte da direção da, da, do Independent Living Institute uh, e também da na direção da Rede Europeia para a Vida Independente. Ok. Thank you, Diego. From myself, Jamie Bowling, from the Independent Living Institute. And I'm here today with Suzanne, Suzanne Berg. Berg. Yep. And I'm part of the Independent Living Movement and work closely with Steel and Independent Living Institute, but I'm a freelancer. Okay, and we've been asked to get, talk about the Swedish situation with personal assistance. And one of the first questions was, what was the role of disability activism and was it important in drafting personal assistance policy? Um, back in the, and maybe Suzanne, if I get wrong, please make change. I think that Otto Ratzke came either in the very beginning of the 80s or the end of the 70s to Sweden. Mm. And he came to Sweden bringing with him his experience of having met the independent living movement in the United States. And when he came, he was thinking that Sweden would be much further along. He had gone to the university in the States and he had personal assistants, other students that he was able to employ. And he came to Sweden and he had this home help service where they came to get him up at seven and put him to bed at 10. And he asked his college friends, are you guys happy with this solution? And of course they weren't. He said, I'd like to go to the bar on Saturday or on Friday and I can't this way. So then he had an idea of having a pilot project on personal assistance, which I understand you've done as well in Portugal. And this um, <clears throat> pilot project was very important in order to get the legislation that came about in 1994. He also at the same time mobilize people to demonstrate against inaccessible traffic, uh, transport and things like this, which was along with independent living. I mean, we need, we push for being able to live ordinary lives and which means being able to take the bus and if I need a personal assistance to take that bus, that's what I should access. Um, do you wanna say something more on that, Suzanne? Yeah. Um... We could say that in, in Sweden in the in 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, there were uh, a lot of uh, reforms in the social care area. Uh, the only thing that they were more directed to people who didn't have as extensive uh, needs for support that uh, we who need personal assistance normally have. And that meant that... Um, when the home care services and stuff like that sort of but that it didn't really fit people who needed help more continuously or or who couldn't really schedule their help and so this is the this is the 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 situation adolf and landed in and the disability the established disability organizations in those days they fought uh, politically to create these housing with services uh, we call them focus housing here and i think that that's a, um, um, a kind of name that has spread which meant that there were a, a number of apartments connected to uh, a central where you you got staff from. Um, I myself, when I injured myself, 1982, was living in Uppsala, and this this kind of housing with services existed in the bigger cities. And so, when I managed to get myself out from hospital, I lived in one of those apartments who were connected to um, a group of staff. 
you had a group of staff during the day, then you had another group of staff during the evening, and during the night if you needed help, you had some sort of patrol who kind of, you know, cruised in cars around the whole city. You had no decide, you could not decide who would come, you could not decide uh, really when you could call on the, you can call for help, but uh, you would then put in line uh, depending on how many other people needed help. So it was one of those mini institutions that people nowadays talk about as independent living sometimes, but basically it was institutions. So that was the, the deal. And then Adolf, when he ended up there, because different places in Sweden were different. These kind of things that I lived in was anyway better and it was in a lot of other local uh, local communities because in some areas you didn't have these housing with services and then people were left either to stay in the family or to live in the old people's home or service house and so that's how it was um, and then this idea about independent living and personal assistance and was introduced in a conference at the end of 1983. And uh, the reaction was very incredulous. In, even within the movement, people didn't really believe that this was possible. They didn't believe that you could get this. That, was a, a, um, that it was something that was a dream that you couldn't achieve. So it was very much against it. So that meant that it was a small group of people who needed personal assistance themselves, who started to kind of, you know, uh, broke away from the, the bigger group and started to, to jointly sit down and discuss what they needed and how they needed to have it. And they, they talked about the way personal assistance should be and how they needed to have the services and what kind of power they needed over it. And also the, the, importance of peer support and learning how to become more and more empowered and, and living a self-determined life. So that's how it is. And then obviously the, the reforms that were enacted in the end of the 70s and the, the beginning of the 80s didn't work for this kind of group, the group that we belong to, most of us. And so then they started to do these, uh, put this money into pro projects. So steel was formed because uh, um, to kind of have an organization that could apply for project money and got the project money for a three year, uh, for, for a three year pilot project. The, the project was um, set up so that people got the money from the local government that would have otherwise given them care. They got money from there and then allowed to take that money with them into the project to steal, who then still got money for the overhead, for the peer support and for other things, training and stuff and evaluation. So that's how it was set up. People came into it. It was a small project. And, but of course, then the, the results started to show almost immediately and other people wanted to come in in it and, and stuff like that. So after two years, it was a, supposed to be a three year project. After two years, Steel went to the Stockholm City Council and applied to become a subcontractor to the care department there. And uh, there, yeah, there was a lot of political infighting and there was a lot of, um, depending on the political kind of party and leaning, uh, they had uh, opinions for or against. Um, and in the end, 1987, this, the pilot project started 87 and two years later, still managed to get the confirmation or the agreement from the city council that they would be uh, subcontractors. It was voted through with one vote in majority. It was a majority of one vote. So that's how, that's how kind of- Agile. 
<laughs> yeah, that's how sort of flimsy the right is. And from there on then still try to kind of, you know, connect and, and make contracts with more and more uh, local government. But in the end, it still depended on where you lived. If you lived in a local region, a local municipality, the, the local kind of communities that we have that has like a, their own kind of political kind of um, rule. Uh, if you lived in one of those that didn't like personalized systems and as an ID, thought of it as liberal and something that just privatized cares and stuff like that, didn't understand the difference between privatization and self-determination, you still couldn't get it. And then up came this parliamentary committee who then uh, did a, a research uh, survey on how people lived who didn't have personal assistance. And the uh, results from that were so bad that I think that the politicians needed to do something about it. And in the end, it became a legal right. Um, this is how it is. Um, it's still flimsy like that, the different political kind of um, lenience or ideologies view personal assistance in a different way. Uh, and it has shifted through the years. Uh, we've almost always had the, the may, main party, the Social Democrats against us, I would say, which has been a problem because they don't really want to kind of support personal assistance. And, uh, but that's how it started. It became a legal right with the, the law was enacted in 1994. Uh, and then very, very fast, it became much, much more expensive, of course, than they thought. Because they had, they had um, calculated the cost on what people cost when they had home care services. And of course, it costs less if you're going to sit at home and wait until somebody comes and give you what you need and you can't do anything else than if you get what you need to kind of actually become part of society. Uh, so um, I remember one of the, 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 the bosses of the social service uh, administration in one of the areas in Stockholm, and she said early on, uh, when the, the law was enacted that if it's going to cost much more, if people need much more hours than calculated, that will only show that the system that we had before was failing. And yeah, it was. And so there we were, and that's what started it. And then, Jamie, yeah, you're going to talk about the legislation, yeah? Yeah, I can go from there. So there is a legislation which covers personal assistance. It became, as Suzanne said, from 1994. And personal assistance is one of the rights. There's 10 rights covering other things as well, which I won't go into now, but they're anything from guide to um, uh, being able to have uh, living arrangements, etc. cetera. Um, they, uh, you asked if there was a current pilot project, but we don't have pilot projects now, but that is the way we started. Um, I don't know the, um, the legislation, when you, when, you, when you need personal assistance, you will talk to your social worker and the social worker will decide if you have what they call basic needs, 20 hours per week of basic needs, if you have that or more, then they'll send you to the government, to the, to the National Board of Health, and you will uh, negotiate with them how many hours you're going to have per, per week. Um, and you'll negotiate both these, these fundamental rights or basic needs of 20 hours or more, and then the hours you need to live your life. So within the legislation, you could have anything from a few hours a week to... Um, double assistance, 36 hours a day somebody could have. Once you get your, once you've negotiated the hours you want for, you need for your life, for your personal assistance, you then will decide to either administrate it yourself, um, administrate it yourself, or to keep the municipality as the administrator, 
to have a cooperative, which is what I did. I joined Steel back in 93. Or you could um, your own company or a private company. So you have the choice of the service provider. Let me just check, turn this off. Somebody's trying to call from France. Um, and then you if I, if I, and it's a, it's a direct payment. The money is calculated per hour where you have the amount being set up by the, the government. They decide how much it is. At this point, it's 303 or four crowns per hour. Um, and in this money, you cover you cover all the costs of personal assistance, meaning the hourly wage, wage for the person working, the social charges, the vacation, but also if there's some smaller costs, um, if you're going to the cinema or going to a movie or something like or a movie or something like that, but also for um, edu training of your personal assistance. Um, when it comes to the Swedish legislation, it's limited to three categories of people. So we don't consider independent living in the way it's not all people's needs are met the same way. If you're deaf and you're blind, you don't get access to personal assistance because they, you're not one of the three categories which is, cons which is covered by the legislations. The three categories are either autism or autism-like um, diagnosis, the second one is brain damage. And the third one is physical or intellectual disability causing um, problems in your daily life. So then it becomes a bit, how do you say, trying to decide if you fit into one of these categories is the first fight that you meet to be able to be eligible for this legislation. And if you're not, then you're, you're, um, your care services will come under the social service legislation. Um, in the questions you've asked, you have to, there's, if there's, um, regardless of age, once, if you are 64 and get personal assistance, you keep the personal assistance after 65. But if you're unlucky and have a stroke at the age of 65, you don't get access to personal assistance. When it comes to children, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the specialist on the kids. I'm not sure if you could explain I mean, children do have the right, but then they also will get support through the school, for example, and then it's not personal assistance. So I, I think most children combine different legislations and different rights to services, um, but some do have the right to personal assistance. When it comes to restriction, normally you're supposed to be able to live your life as you want to, but the restrictions are getting more and more heavy, if you can say it that way. Different cities can go into details and say that you're not allowed to have personal assistance to do for, for gardening or in my case for shoveling snow or things like this. Your personal assistants are not allowed to climb a ladder uh, to change a light bulb or some things like that. So you do have some restrictions you're supposed to watch out for. But normally it should be able to for going to school or going to work or living the life that you're going to live. Um, you asked the number of persons that have personal assistance. Today, I think it's around 14,000. Would you know those figures, Susanna? That's, that's uh, from, you have, we have a mixed system where some people have the personal assistance with direct payment through the Social Insurance Administration, which is on national level. And then you have other people who have the uh, personal assistance that, or direct payment for personal assistance from the local government. Uh, but all in all, it was, I checked today, it's uh, 19,900 something, uh, a couple. It's going down, we're gonna come to that later. Of those, around 13,900 uh, have, uh, have uh, assistance payment on the uh, national level. And that's if the number has decreased, which you just said that it's going down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I myself had the personal assistance through the state, but in 2012, they had direct, how do you say, um, they were told to cut costs. And to cut costs, they started 
narrowing narrowing the right to personal assistance. Mm -hmm. So what my needs that were considered basic needs of 22 hours have become now, they consider the same needs as 11 hours. And it's because they, yeah, the, before they yeah. would say taking a shower and getting ready would take an hour. Now they decide it takes five minutes. It's the time that they put the hands on the skin, which is considered the personal assistance. So as the, as the case, I only heard a bit of the story from the UK, but the same thing in Sweden. The legislation when it first came out was quite good, but today we almost need a new legislation because the cuts are becoming so hard that people are, are losing access. But I, so when I lost my assistance from the state in 2012, I was sent to the municipality. The municipality said I had the right to personal assistance, but they cut my hours by 50%. At the time I was working for ENIL, I had the job where I was traveling a lot in Europe as the director of ENIL. And I mean, I was very, very active. And I, if, with that cut in those hours, I would have almost needed to leave my job. So I had to find a volunteer for two years because in the legislation, you have the right to appeal if, you, if you're not satisfied with the decision. So I appealed the decision, but that took two years. And I actually won. So I got my personal assistance in the same amount that I have now, but through the city and not through the state. But that two years was a pretty tough time in my life because I had to find somebody who was willing to work 160 hours a month, but only get paid 70 hours a month. And I happened to find somebody from Houstonia who was dumb enough to do that, who, who appreciate doing that. I wouldn't have been able to find somebody in Sweden to do that. So the times have gotten tough in Sweden as well, which we're seeing actually across the world when it comes to cuts in the services for disabled people. Um, do you want to add something there, Suzanne? Yeah, should we go to changes or are you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, the, the, the situation is quite complex in Sweden. So I think I'm going to try to make it slightly less more complex slightly less com <laughs> complex uh, but there are certain things that i think is worth noting that could be maybe worth knowing and and maybe worth looking off out for in other countries uh, when the legislation came it was very simple but it had these three categories of people so it wasn't you had the the social care act was the basic uh, act that provided care or yeah care that's what we what it is they provide uh, to people who need that but this was an a, a separate a special legislation so it's an extensive extension to this which meant that it it the legislation started by defining out a specific group of people and so you had to kind of qualify into this group of people that had the right to um, more qualified or more specific, specified services. And you qualified to the legislation through being part of one of those three categories. The two first categories is purely medically uh, defined. Their diagnosis and uh, very much connected to medical definitions. The third category was from the start meant to be more open and, and they talked about people with different uh, impairments who create, who causes um, extensive problems in everyday life and need for help with other services. Uh, that sounds very good but as time has gone on and and the assessment pro process has become narrower and narrower because because people want to cut and um, they talk about um, you know being being safe for justice this definition has become narrow more and more narrow so the the pure act by having a group of people that ha you have to access a specific group of people to have access to the right is good until it isn't because it can also be a double-edged sword because the assessment and the political parties can use it to cut down the groups so very early from the start uh, it cut out people who for example had uh, 
people who are deaf wasn't part of it. And people who have neuropsychiatric uh, impairments uh, had very much problems to get into it, it unless they qualified for the autism and autism-like services. Uh, to, to then get, so you qualify into the legislation, then you have to qualify into the right for personal assistance. There's different things. So there's, you know, the, there's the, the first is the, the wider keyhole and you enter that one. Then they will look at whether or not you have the right to personal assistance. To have the right to personal assistance, you need to have what from the beginning was called basic needs. Basic needs wasn't part of the legislation from the first year. It came two years after the legislation as part of the huge push for cutting, so cutting costs. So the basic needs, the, the, the demand for having basic needs was purely a mechanism to even further cut the group that had the right to personal assistance. So that is also a tool for cutting people off. Um, and so from the start, it was fairly okay for the group was fairly regular and stuff. Then they started to define what basic needs is. Uh, as Jamie said, from the start, you also had, if you could count your minutes of basic needs together, and you had 20 hours per week in average, you were granted personal assistance through the social insurance administration. That doesn't mean that you got 20 hours. That meant that the Social Insurance Administration would pay for the hours you needed. So you got much more, for example. I had in those days, I think around 90 hours per week and I qualified in by having around 25, 26 hours of basic needs. The only thing the basic needs does and the counting of them is decide who's gonna pay for your assistance. And what happened is that it's they're starting this talk about maybe it cost too much, maybe there were too much uh, cheating going on in the system, and and there wasn't really, you know, it felt a bit like disabled people had run away and they were no, you know, people couldn't control us anymore. So obviously you needed to talk about cheating, you talked about cost, you talked about people who shouldn't really have assistance. And it came also from the political level, this kind of discourse. Uh, it came also through uh, the regulation letters that got to the agency, the social insurance agency. So the social insurance agency then started to interpret what really was basic needs. And the first thing they came to was like, nah, not all basic needs were, were basic needs. It had to be, you know, a specific type. And then they, they started with saying like, okay, this wasn't the thing. They took away the only, they, they focused on food said the only time it was a basic need is when somebody put the food on the spoon and lifted it to your mouth. Nothing around it, not cutting the food on the, on, the, on, on the plate or anything like that. So that was the first cut. And people started to fall out. And there was also this talk about, well, clothing, putting on clothes was a basic need, but not all clothes. Surely, you know, outdoor clothes wasn't part of basic needs. So then those minutes uh, disappeared. And that's when people started to fall out. I think you fell out in, the, in some of that time, Amy. And then the social insurance agency has really started to redefine and, and push a new legal interpretation of what is basic needs, or as they call them now, integrity close needs. And by doing that, they are cutting and cutting and cutting the number of people uh, that have the right to personal assistance. Uh, we have uh, from approximately 80% of people, when you applied for personal assistance the first time, from approximately granting 80% of those applicants, 
the first time. Now, the social insurance agency grant less than 20%. I think it's even five. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's a little bit more, but yeah. <laughs> but that's the new applications. And at the same time, the people who had assistance for a very long time, since 1994, when the legislation was enacted, are being pushed out because they reassessment and then recalculate what is your personal, what is really the basic need, gets smaller and smaller. I was reassessed the last time, 2013, and they had a backlog in Stockholm. So I, they didn't have time to look at me and reassess me until there was a stop of the reassessment program process in 2018. If, I had, if they had had time to do that, I wouldn't have had social insurance administration assistance today. So that's what's happening. And from, the last five years, approximately 2,000, more than 2,000, 2,300 people have lost the right to assistance. This, then we're not talking about the same people, but we're talking about the statistics here. At the same time, Sweden today has around 10 million people in population, which is about, about 1 million more than we had 15, 20 years ago. So we should really be much more people, but instead it's going down and it keeps going down. We've lost uh, the social insurance agency themselves told the government in 2017, in the end of 2017, that now they had to interpret this law in such a way that almost nobody would get assistance. They actually contacted the government and say, sorry, but we feel the need to interpret this this way. So if you want somebody to have assistance tomorrow, you need to do something. The government went in and said, we're going to put an emergency break on the reassessments. So we've had an emergency break on the reassessment since the 1st of April, 2018. If they open the floodgates and start reassessing again, there will be very, very, very few of us that we have assistance at all. Because today they only count what they call active time. So for example, if you go on to the toilet the only time, the only seconds or minutes they're going to count as basic needs are the minutes that somebody is, an assistant is going to have their hand on your naked body, basically. And if you're going to count integrity close needs that, like that, nobody will get up to 20 hours. Now, people are again going to fall down into the municipalities. And the municipalities don't have the money, so they start to cut also. And today, there's more and more people who don't have assistance at all. Uh, there's also people who are being forced to then apply for these um, semi-institutional housing with services. Uh, there are small children who are not able to be part of their family lives because their parents can't, uh, don't have the resources to spend all the hours with them and might have other kids and need to work. So we are now building small institutions or homes for, for young kids. So this is where we are at the moment. Um, so there's been really no changes in the legislation, but the way the legislation is interpreted has changed massively. And in the front of this interpretation is the social insurance agency who is supposed to be the agency, the government agency providing security and support to the citizens. So this is what it is. And during these times, there have been different tools that have you know, used for assessments. And I'm not going to say that we have a specific tool just now, but there is a, there was a tool and then it started with another one and then they cut down and cut down and cut down. 
And uh, so from the beginning, before we had the, the legislative change in the middle of the 1990s, when they were trying to cut the first time, the, there wasn't really a main way to assess, but in the, the places where they did a good assessment, it was based on the personal story. You met the uh, uh, official handler from the social insurance agency or the municipality, and you talked together about your life, your needs, what your needs were, and whether or not what type of assistance and how many hours you needed to live an independent life and do those things that you had the right to do in your everyday life. So it would work well in the beginning. And then they put this idea about basic needs in. And then after that, it has been cuts and cuts and cuts. And it has uh, escalated during the last five years. So that's how it is. I think um, there's a couple of questions that we skipped and that was when you talked about assessment is um, how often are the assessments repeated and usually yeah. uh, normally okay you said we have this it's frozen right now but otherwise it was yeah. every two years at the national level it's just and every it's, year it's just at the frozen at the social insurance agency level at the national level people who have assistance in, through the municipalities are still reassessed sometimes more often than once a year exactly yeah hmm. and, it, and, and every time out? you and every time you get reassessed you can lose hours or the whole thing. And those carrying out the assessment are social workers, either employed by the municipality or the government. Yeah. The next thing then is funding and how the legislation is funding. You talked about um, the basic hours and that's the funding comes where the municipality always pays the first 20 hours of personal assistance for everybody whether they receive the personal assistance at the state level or at the municipal level. But if you have your, your personal assistance through the state, the city pays the first 20 hours. And then when Suzanne, she said she had 90 hours, those other 70 hours would be paid by uh, state money. But if you get your personal assistance at the local level, then the municipality has to pay for everything. So this, this, um, complicated situation means sometimes in the beginning I felt like a ping pong ball when the city said we don't want you and the state said we don't want you and you got batted around. I saw somebody asked a question should personal assistance be at the state level or at the decentralized and I say it should be at the state level. We say in independent living it should be at the state level because one you're going to have differences at the municipality level if you live in a rich city or a poor city and also now when I don't have personal assistance at the national level, I can't really move because I'm not sure I'll get personal assistance in the next city that I go to. And that keeps me from not being able to move. So personal assistance is funded either through its tax money and it's either through the municipality or the state. Um, the, personal, the personal assistance then, it depends on the amount of hours you have per if you have 30, 300 hours per month or 400 hours per month, you divide it up and we, are, we can hire our own personal assistants and decide if we're going to have, say, if I had 320 hours, I could say I have two full-time workers, 160 hours each. But that's complicated because if they get sick, then you lose somebody. So then there's a lot of um, part-time work in personal assistance because you want to make sure you have a good group of people and are able to cover when somebody else gets sick. You also um, don't have uh, hours, so you can. We have to. We have to. Um, we have to uphold the work time law and the, uh, the European Work Time Directive, and so you have to employ people, um, providing them with the, the the pauses and stuff like that. And you very often don't have. I mean, if you, you could have employed two full-time persons but one full-time person but you don't need the assistance between eight and five you need it in different areas of the day so that's also why you are very often have several uh, assistants on uh, part-time 
personal assistance is not means tested in Sweden if you're getting it through the LSS legislation. If you get personal assistance through the social legislation, making it even more complicated, you would have to pay so much money per hour and there's a maximum per month, but I'm not sure what that price is right now. I don't know if you would know those. Um, it, it, it depends on what municipality you live Where you in. Live. But it's not means mm -hmm. tested by itself. You get the hours, but then you have to pay a fee. And the fee depends on how much income you have or wealth, wealth mm -hmm. or whatever. From funding, the question is on the service providers. I talked about that a little bit in the beginning, say it could be the city, <clears throat> because I can choose. <clears throat> and in the, in, in the beginning, it was most people were choosing to stay with the city, where now the, there's a, a small percentage of people actually staying uh, with the city. And then you would either say, have your own company, but with the changes in the legislation or the, not the changes in the legislation, the interpretation and the different, um, requirements coming is becoming more and more difficult to be able to be your own employer because you don't before you used to get the money two months in advance now you get it two months after and that means you have to have a private uh, capital where you can afford to pay two months salary for all of your assistance and there's not everybody not many people who have that kind of money well you can but be I, you can be a sole uh, a, a, an employer if even but then you don't have a company but then you can only use the money you get the money one month ahead but the money okay. you don't use that month is you'll have to pay back which means that you can't for example um collect money and 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 do a, a, a kind of more costly uh, training or or a trip where for example your assistance things so, so you get very limited like that um, the user of personal system can des does decide who's going to work um, and they decide when. Um, when it comes to the training, I think that depends a bit on who's the provider. Through the independent living, we'll have some training through the through steel, for example, but mostly the training's done by myself uh, for my personal assistance because I don't feel that other people can train them but you may have other service providers who actually do some of the training themselves. Um, as the, the, per as the, the person needing the personal assistance, the user, um, for example, in independent living, we do have to go through a couple of courses to be able to learn, learning about the legislation um, so that you make sure you respect the, legis the working legislation, et cetera. But it's not such a, it's not a, it's not a complicated um, uh, training, but you do get some training. I'm not sure the cities and, and would provide training to the person choosing them. I don't think so. Um, you can. You, I mean, basically, th th there's a lot of limitations in, in what it is or isn't. But basically, the, the legislation, the right to direct payment, give you the right to decide what training your assistant needs. It has, of course, to have a, have, have a connection to, to your need for personal assistance. You can't, for example, send an assistant out and get a, a driving license. Um, that's not uh, um, permitted. But even if, if that could have been very kind of useful. But you, have, you can get any sort of training that is, is, is getting this assistance to, to assist you better. You can also use that part of the, the direct payment to train yourself. For example, in Steel, you could go together with others and can arrange, for example, a weekend or, or weeks uh, go on and a peer support. And we could then uh, take, the, take the costs from that, from the direct payment. So it depends on where you are. A lot of companies limit this and say that they provide all the training and that is because they want to take that part of the assistant benefit and make a profit from it. In steel you can decide yourself what you need. The only, the only exception to that is if you have for example a need for some sort of medical training to kind of get the delegation from a doctor your assistance then those kind of 
uh, those kind of courses. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. I told yeah. somebody today there's always a <laughs> cat involved. Yeah, I need to kind of I need to to kind of detach the <laughs> keyboard before I go. <laughs> um, anyway, so it is it is you have a lot of rights, but a lot of people don't know they have because they choose these private companies or they choose to stay in the municipality. So you have the right to 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 use when you have the direct payment, you have the right to use it in a way that is promoting empowerment and independent living. But uh, in reality, a lot of people don't understand. Can you go down? Sorry. Um, contracts are signed between the assistant and the service provider. So in my case, I signed the contract with my assistant, but they also signed the contract with Steele, who is actually paying the money. And I signed a contract with Steele so that my direct payment goes to steel and then they do all the paperwork because I don't like to do the paperwork. But if I had my own company, I would be doing all the paperwork. I would get the money and pay all the salaries, et cetera. All the funding has to be, you have to have a receipt for everything, whatever the cost is, because it is a bookkeeping that can be, can be checked. Um, so every cost has to be booked. When it comes to, people with intellectual disabilities, they can have personal assistance. They would have it through um, supported decision, decision making. We have an organization which is an independent living organization called JOG, where the people are, I think they have 400 or 500 members today. They would all have an intellectual disability and most probably multiple disabilities. And they would live in their own apartments and have their personal assistants coming. The difference is that I can pick up the phone if my personal assistant calls me at seven and said I'm sick today, I can call somebody else. They can't. So they have to have a, a system where there's, um, uh, where there's a guarantee of the personal assistant. So somebody's making sure they're checking up so that the assistant does actually come to the person who themselves couldn't pick up the telephone and call for extra help. Family members are allowed to be personal assistants in Sweden. In the, in the, in the independent living movement, we, we don't recommend that. I say that you're not going to be very self-determinant if you have your mother working for you. I mean, your mother would probably make a lot of decisions or your, your older sister. And working with my kids, I wanted to try once or twice. That didn't work at all. We say real independence comes with when you're working with other people and you have a different guarantee of the services that somebody's paid to do the service and they respect it as a job and it works as a it's a professional engagement and there we get to the last point what remains to be mm -hmm. done suzanne <laughs> yeah we need to get back to basic <laughs> yeah. there is a big push now to to get and steel has um steel has uh developed and, and, and pushed for a certain solution in the true independent living way to not just complain, but uh, propose what you need. And with the first part of that was um, a kind of PM or uh, a development or we, we, we sat together and did an analysis and, and came up with the solution on how to move all the people who have assistance up on the, gov on the national level because you need to be on the national level because otherwise you're, um, you're always going to be um, uh, a prisoner to your neighbors in a way. And the municipalities have more or less money depending on their population basis. And we have a demographic trend in, in Europe and very much in Sweden with urbanization. So we have more and more very small municipalities. And if you are somebody who have an injury or are born with assistant needs in a very small uh, um, municipality, it will be extremely hard for you to get personal assistance because the money simply isn't there. They don't have the finances. While if you lift it up on the national level, you can, you can spread the cost over the whole country. And you're also not, uh, um, 
you're not a capture to stay in that municipality. You can move without the risk of being assessed. So that's what, uh, that is what's going on now. There's a big push from some of the parties in the government to kind of change this so that, um, that uh, all the assistance is lifted up on national level. There is um, a proposal uh, being, um, there, there, there is supposed to be um, a committee, um, a parliamentary committee doing a proposal on this. The problem with that is if, if that is the only thing that they will take a decision on, the people who now have assistance in the municipality, if they are going to be moved up to the national level, and if that means a reassessment of their needs, they're going to lose it all. So we are now fighting for them to understand that you can't just move the finance responsibility up to national level. You also have to uh, address the way the decision making has gone away from independent living and still will uh, start the same process and do an analysis and come up with a proposal in the next seven or eight months. It's, uh, it's um, planned to be ready to May, June next year. But we'll see if that also is managed to go up and if we manage to get that through in the government in the parliament, then we should hopefully get back to an okay status. But I don't know how many votes that's going to be. If there's going to be one vote again, that's going to be on the right or the wrong side of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But that's where we are. It's not without hope, but it feels a bit depressing. <laughs>